Michelle is a local attorney and she also works with the Rental Mediation Board. Michelle, welcome and good morning. Good morning, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank it's you for joining been... us. I'm gonna let you get right into it because we are running very late and my apologies. Sure. All right, well, I'm gonna share, share my screen here. Give me one second. Here we go. I'm so glad to be here today. Last year, as you were saying, we, I was there with my kids and we had such a fun time. Um, and this year, seeing all the familiar faces and hearing about the programs that we've worked with and knowing how important housing is, it's, it's really nice how you guys have put the, book, the program together and thank you for including me in it. Um, I'm gonna talk today about tenant rights and responsibilities. And um, a lot has been happening. Um, my name is Michelle Robertson. I'm a local attorney, and I also am the president CEO of Sierra Property Group, Inc., which we do business as Sierra Property Management. I've been a tenant most of my life, including in Santa Barbara. And in my legal career, I represented both landlords and tenants. Now I'm mostly called as a witness in court cases, but I'm still a bar, a bar card carrying lawyer here in California. Um, although I am a lawyer, I'm not providing anybody legal advice. This is the kind of the um, disclosure I have to give uh, during this presentation, but I'm presenting the laws as I know them and understand them, given my experience. Uh, just, uh, you know, a little preamble as we go through the presentation. I'm going to use the term property provider, and this is just going to generically identify everybody who's known as owners of real property, property managers, landlords. Um, a special note regarding uh, voucher holders, it does not include a lot of the additional rights afforded to those on the program, but some will be addressed as we move along. And um, hot off the presses, September 1, the COVID-19 Tenant Protection Act was passed, and I'm going to cover that at the end of the presentation, but during the presentation I'll be talking about paying the rent as a requirement and three-day notices, just know that this not, does not, uh, may not apply right now. Um, and wait till the end so you can understand how we handle everything um, regarding rents due starting March 1 of 2020. Um, so we're gonna start with prior to move in. What, what is the rights and responsibility at the initial lease process? Because there are tenant rights, even when you're just engaging with a landlord and looking for houses, um, housing, and what are your responsibilities while doing that? So we have, you have the right to fair housing. Tenants have the right to fair housing where they have to be able to rent real estate regardless of the race or legal status, which sounds, you know, kind of like common sense. Um, the Federal Fair Housing Act, it protects against discriminatory actions by a property provider, such as making a decision based on race or color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, and new for 2020 is veteran or military status, and also handicapped. California Unrest Civil Rights Act, it protects discriminatory acts, discriminatory acts by a business establishment. And that includes landlords. Um, pro property providers are in the business of running homes. So all of these laws apply to all of the property providers. Um, so during the qualification process, the property provider should have a credit, credit policy that's applied equally across all applicants. A typical credit policy has three different standards um, where they're looking at your income, they're look, looking at your credit, and they're looking at your references. As long as they're applying all three of those to every single applicant that comes in the same way, then they can avoid a discriminatory um, act or accusation of it. So they also can't discriminate about the source of income and new to 2020 is the tenant's receipt of federal, state, or local housing subsidies like Section 8. There are different rules of thoughts or different ways that the landlords are using that income, but this, the, um, the best practice and the housing authority already pre-qualifies tenants on this regard is to make sure that the part, portion of rent that the tenant is responsible for and knowing that the tenant has additional income to cover that portion of the rent. So if the landlord standard is two times the rent or three times the rent, then that's the portion that the tenant is responsible for is what the landlord is qualifying as income um, because housing is going to be covering the remaining portion. 
Um, I understand that the housing authority already pre-qualifies everybody to make sure they have, are able to have three times the rent of what they're obligated for. Um, property providers can't charge more than two months rent as security deposit for an unfurnished unit. We have some people when they apply to us, for example, when they say I have very bad credit, I'm not gonna qualify, can I give you three months, four months rent of security deposit? And we have to tell them, no, it's actually not allowed by the law. Um, and likewise, I've seen landlords say, I'll let you move in if you give me more money. So that's not allowed. A tenant has the right to only have to pay two months security deposit for an unfurnished unit. Now, this is also different for service providers new to 2020. They're, they only have to pay one month's rent of a security deposit for an unfurnished unit. Uh, property providers can't charge more than approximately the $45 per application. That $45 number, and I say approximate, is because it started um, in the early 80s and they had a base number and said it could increase by CPI and now we're at the $45 mark with every increase. And they also cannot make a portion of the security deposit non-refundable. Um, we've seen property providers say uh, in their leases, you're going to move in. I don't think you're going to be able to clean it properties properly when you move out. So just know I'm going to charge you $200 non-refundable for a cleaning fee. That's not a lot. Um, they will have to provide you a receipt or account for it, um, but there's nothing in your security deposit that cannot be refundable. So the tenant's responsibilities in all of this is honesty in the application process including advising the property provider of all the occupants that will be residing in the unit. Um, I show properties sometimes and I'm really surprised when somebody asks me, are children allowed? And I say, you know, it, it, it catches me off guard because absolutely, that goes to the discriminate, discrimination. You can't, you can't um, discriminate for familial status. Um, so, you know, it's, you gotta be careful though. You move in, you didn't tell them that you had your aunt, your cousin, and another child moving in and all of a sudden your lease agreement says that the only occupants allowed are the people on this lease. So you're immediately violating the lease by not being honest during the application process. So now you've moved in and we're going to discuss during the tenancy what are the rights and responsibilities that a tenant has during the, the tenancy process. So the first and the major thing that you have the right to is a habitable premises. So every lease, even if it doesn't say it on the lease, there's an implied warranty of habitability. That means that it has to be fit for human habitation during the term of your lease. Um, that means you, you have to have heat, you have to have water, you can't be rented the shed in the backyard. Um, that's not considered to be a habitable premises. The next one I want to talk about is the right to privacy. Um, you have the right to quiet enjoyment during the tenancy. Now, the property provider can only enter your dwelling during the term of the lease or while you're residing in it in very limited situations. So I listed them out here and I'm not going to read them all to you, but it includes emergency, necessary repairs and improvements or to reply services that were previously approved by the tenant. So if you call, you have a service issue. The water's leaking and I can't turn it off and the landlord um, tries to make arrangements for it with you and they're not, you guys aren't able to communicate and then they post a 24 hour notice on your door. They have a right to go in after that notice has been properly posted. Um, to complete the pre-expiration -ins inspection, um, you know, if you're going to get charged at a security deposit, we'll talk a little bit about that later. To show the unit to prospective buyers, tenants, lenders, repairmen. Right now, that's a little bit tricky, especially with the virus. Um, trying to let people into your home and hopefully both parties respect and understand that we're in a pandemic and treat this, um, you know, right and responsibility accordingly. And um, under a court order, you know, to allow entry into a court order. <laughs> that's another reason that the property provider can enter your dwelling. And again, that unless it's an emergency, they do still need to give you proper notice. Now, the tenant responsibility in all this is that you have to allow the property provider to proceed with the maintenance or service if you've been given the proper notice. So don't, don't change the lock. Um, don't open the door and say, yeah, you're, you're not coming in. I'm not going to let you next week. Um, once you get that notice, it's important to comply with that notice and hopefully you guys can work together in advance. So it doesn't get to the point where you're given notice. 
Now, maintenance does include routine and non-emergency repairs, decoration improvements, whether or not the resident has, has agreed to them. So just keep that in mind, um, you know, for this tenant responsibility. Now, the right to reside during the duration of the lease term. I didn't know a better way to put it, but if you have a term lease, um, your landlord can't give you a 30-day notice and say, yeah, I, I, I want you to move. Um, you're entitled to that entire period. The most common question I get regarding this is, what if the property sells to somebody else and I have a lease in place? Well, the lease carries. So if you have a lease starting today all the way through next year, you should feel secure that you're not gonna be asked to move if you're complying with all terms of the lease during that period. So the lease term is the contractual period that you enter into with the property provider and your agreement. So it's a beginning date and end date. The city of Santa Barbara has special rules regarding this. Um, they require a minimum one year lease to be offered to the tenant each year. And Mr. Fredericks, he brought up the resources, um, the city's website, and it's a very good resource to go in and read and what ordinances require and what they're doing in the city. Um, so that means that when you sign a lease, the, the landlord can't say this is only for six months. They actually have to offer it to you for a year. Now, if you as a tenant say, I actually only want six months, um, they can give that to you, but the tenant has to sign a written agreement saying that they've waived their right to that one year term. Now, a year later, the property provider either needs to offer you another year lease, or if applicable, they can terminate your lease and say, you know what, this was nice, it's been a year, we don't want to renew this lease anymore. Um, and there's special rules regarding that we'll get into a little bit later. But if they do that, they do have to provide you a right to a reconciliation session with that termination notice. And that means that you guys can go to mediation for free with the Rental Housing Mediation Board. Or if one of the parties does not want to go to the Rental Housing Mediation Board, then the party that does not want to go for the free service would have to pay for that service. But the tenant's entitled to that conciliation session to try to work out as to why the lease is not going to be renewed. And again, it assumes that the tenant's compliant with all the lease terms. Um, now, this is, we were just talking about people with term lease. What happens to people with month-to-month -month tenancies? And um, when can a, a landlord tell you, a property provider, say, okay, I'm going to terminate your tenancy now? Um, they can't terminate certain tenancies if, you know, if you're not exempt, um, unless, the owner or a close relative of the owner intends to occupy the unit, or the property is going to be withdrawn from the rental market completely, or the property provider is complying with a local ordinance, a court order, or other governmental en entity that's requiring the property be vacated. And the fourth reason, which during non-COVID times applies, right now under the COVID Protection Act, it does not. Um, is if the property provider intends to substantially demolish or remodel the rental unit. Now it's very specific as to what substantial remodel means. It doesn't mean um, I need to repair the, you know, replace the carpet and do new paint. It actually requires that they can't do the work within a 30 day period or they need to get special permits from the city. So it has to be substantial. Um, rent raises and new to 2020 is a cap on how much rent can be raised if you're not in an exempt unit. Uh, so property providers can't raise rents more than 5% plus CPI per year and never more than 10% um, unless you're exempt in an exempt property under this law. So which properties are exempt? Um, in this, you know, it, it's a little more complicated than what I have outlined here because there's different categories for each of them. But generally speaking, um, units that can be individually sold, so single family homes or condos are the most, um, you know, easily identified. Sometimes you can have a huge lot and we say, hey, if, it's a, if there's more than one property on the same lot, you know, the same APN, then it's not exempt. So you can have a 12 acre lot, lot and have three properties on that lot just because they're single family homes does not mean, it mean they're exempt. They have to be able to be individually sold. Um, tenancies that are under a year or two years if there's a change in composition to the tenancy, but one tenant remain constant. So as I was discussing earlier, after the year anniversary for the city of Santa Barbara, 
the landlord can terminate that lease if the year expiration is before that one year mark or right about that one year mark. They could say they don't want to continue for the next year because this law wouldn't apply. Um, it would make that property exempt. Now, if there's a house or, or an apartment where there's, there's one roommate, but there's been a lot of people moving in and out, then it has to be a minimum of two years um, that it would not apply. Uh, new housing, um, 15 years or newer and ADU. So ADU is fairly new to, to us. It's only 10 years old. So that kind of gets swept in into any property 15 years or newer. And it's a rolling basis. So it's not any property built in 2020 and I'm ahead. It's any property built 15 years prior is exempt. Um, a duplex where one is one of the units is owner occupied. Now the owner had to have occupied it as their primary residence at the inception of the lease and continues to occupy it in order for the property to be exempt. And then mobile homes, university owned dormitories are also exempt. Um, if you're not exempt and you're asked to move for one of the four reasons that we discussed two, two slides prior, um, then the tenant is entitled to a relocation benefit. So the property provider has to give them what's equivalent to one month's rent, either 15 days after giving the notice for termination and giving the reason for the termination notice, um, or waiving the last month's rent as long as it's written in that termination notice. Now the city of Santa Barbara um, has drafted a uh, relocation benefit and the proposal is two months rent instead of the one month's rent relocation benefit. Now what's the tenant's responsibilities in all of this? And these are just general points. Um, all of the before applied for, you know, everybody complying with the lease terms. So that means, you know, you paid your rent on time, except during this um, March 1 through January 31 period because of the COVID protections. Uh, you're not committing waste or reporting issues. You're not allowing um, water to come down from the roof and not saying anything and making the property um, devalue. Um, because of the lack of maintenance and because of the lack of notice to the landlord. You're complying with the lease terms, such as not being a nuisance, causing disturbances to your neighbors, um, or subletting, which most leases have a provision against subletting without a written agreement. And you're complying with laws. You're not selling drugs. You're not, you know, causing any kind of public um, or private disturbances or nuisances. So, in anticipation of moving, um, what are the rights and responsibilities before moving? And kind of in line of termination of tenancies, what kind of notices is the tenant entitled to? So we have the three-day notices, um, and those are for violating the lease. And, and for various notices um, that could be remedied, they have to give you three days um, notice to be able to remedy your action or uh, pay the rent or whatever it is. If you had a dog, remove the dog. And the three days, if you're given the notice, it excludes weekends and court holidays. So that means if you get a notice on Friday, um, on Monday, the landlord can't go to court and try to evict you immediately because you didn't remedy. You are given that Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday because you exclude Saturday and Sunday. Now, if Monday was a holiday, then you have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday is when the land, the property provider can go um, to to court and do something and escalate the matter. Although you're still entitled to your proof saying that whatever it was you're being accused of was not true. Um, now, 30-day notices for certain tenancies, and that's for tenancies under a year. Um, if they happen to be month to month, then the the property provider can give a 30 day notice to terminate that tenancy without any cause because you don't fall under the act. Um, you're not exempt until you're a resident for at least a year. 60 day notices for certain tenancies. So if you live there for over a year, you fall under the act. Um, or even if you don't fall under the act, you're still entitled to um, 60 day notice of termination of tenancy. Now, if you fall under the act, you have to be told exactly why. And if you don't, then there, no reason has to be stated. Um, and then there's a 90 day notice for certain tenancies and those are for our voucher holders. Um, you're entitled to a 90 day notice if uh, there is a, a good cause for termination of tenancy. And um, the section eight contracts do have their own causes listed as to why you can terminate that type of contract. 
Um, now, tenant notices. Um, now, say the tenant wants to move out um, if they're not on a fixed term lease, meaning if you're not contractually obligated for the term. So, if you had to sign a one year lease in October, you can go to the landlord in January and give them a 30 day notice. You're actually contractually obligated until the following year if you're on a one year term. Um, then you should give a 30 day written notice to your property provider saying that I'm going to move. Um, if you're on a month to month tenancy, a lot of lease agreements and written agreements actually say that even if you're on a fixed term lease, tenants responsible for giving 30 day notice before that term ends also if they don't intend to continue that tenancy. So just be aware of that. Now I want to caution everybody to review the written agreement carefully because some leases do say that if you're on a month to month lease, you can't give notice on the 15th if your month to month and rent is due on the first you have to give it on the first. Um, so that means that if you give notice on the 15th, all of a sudden you're responsible for 45 days because you had to give it by the first before the next tenancy renew. So just read your lease carefully if it has that kind of provision. Otherwise, 30 day notice is sufficient. Um, now the tenant is responsible for rent during that last 30 day period. The most common thing we hear is, can you just take it out of my security deposit? And most leases say, no, security deposits cannot be used for, um, to pay the rent, although they can be used after the move out to pay, pay any rent that had not been paid. But caution, you could be charged with the late fee because you didn't pay that last month's rent, um, thinking it's going to be taken out of your security deposit. So kind of weigh out what, what it work to you. Okay, initial inspections. So you've given notice or you've received notice. You have a right to an initial inspection to be conducted 14 days before your scheduled move out date. Now that's statutory. Um, the property provider should tell you, hey, here's, here's your right um, and here's a two week window. You know, you told me you're gonna be out by the 31st, between the 16th and the 31st, um, you know, I'll make myself available. Let's coordinate a time if you wanna have an inspection. The purpose of the inspection is to allow you, the tenant, to be able to remedy anything that's wrong with the unit and not have it be taken out of your security deposit. So the property provider can go in and even if your house is full of furniture and stuff on the walls, they can just write down like, I can't see behind that wall. However, if there's a hole behind that wall, I consider it damaged and I expect that to at least be patched up. Um, I expect it professionally clean. Um, there's a screen that's torn. You know, I would charge you for this. Um, if you want to fix it before you move out, that's your right. Otherwise, I'm going to hire somebody else who might be more expensive. Um, so that doesn't mean you have to have the initial inspection, but it's a good practice to have it so that you know what you might get charged for. And you might be able to be handy and fix it yourself so that you're not charged for it at all. Now, giving possession. Um, and before I continue with giving possession, and it's kind of in line with giving possession. And the most common thing I hear from tenants is they receive their notice of pre-move inspection. They say, no, I don't, I don't need one. Thank you very much. They're ready to move out on the 31st and they call the property provider um, five o'clock PM and they say, all right, I'm ready for my inspection and for you to pick up the keys. And it, it doesn't quite work that way. The purpose again is to give you the, the right to know so you can fix it. Now, if the property provider is able to show up at five and they're accommodating and they say, you know, thank you, but this is everything you're gonna, I'm gonna charge you for, um, the tenant could say, well, then I'm gonna fix it and keep the keys. Well, then you're gonna continue going for rent um, for the days that you need to fix and take care of that. So giving possession is really important so you don't continue to incur rent. And the property provider, they can't read your mind. Um, they can't enter without the written notice um, with, you know, without giving you written notice, as we talked before, unless they have explicit possession of the unit. So until they know that they have the unit and it's theirs, um, they can't go into that unit and it's still your property, meaning you still are responsible for paying the rent. Now, because you can't hand over your unit the way you can hand over a car or a book you've been loaned, the symbolic way to get possession is returning the key. Is, is that the only way? It's not. Um, you can put in writing to your property provider and say, I have completely moved out. I will mail you the keys later, but the unit is yours. So that's a good way to give back possession, but it's really important to be sure you are clear 
that the property provider now has possession of the unit so that you don't continue to incur rent. So after moving out and kind of goes to security deposits, um, the tenant's rights is that you are, you know, um, entitled to get your security deposit and an accounting within 21 days after move out. Um, the most common thing I hear is the 21st day at 8 a.m. I get an email, it's day 21, I haven't received it, you now owe me two times my security deposit. And um, the laws of silence as to the tenant receiving it within 21 days, it, they have to give it within 21 days. So if they put it in the mail within that 21 day period, then that's okay, um, they're still compliant with the law. Uh, you can't be charged for normal wear and tear. And this is a, you know, a very complicated subject for a lot of, in a lot of parts, but to kind of keep it a little bit simple, um, every property provider should have what normal wear and tear for their carpets and their walls um, paint and flooring is. So how we do it here, for example, is a lot of carpets, they have a five-year life. If you live there for eight years, and the carpet has been worn down, then, you know, just by act of walking across it, um, then you can't be charged for replacing that carpet because it should have lasted five years, it's lasted seven, um, and it's not incredibly damaged. Um, some carpets, however, are 10-year car carpets, and that's considered what the normal life is. So we had a tenancy once where they thought that because the carpet was there when they moved in and they thought it was about three, four years old, that the life of the carpet was over and they spray painted daisies and mushrooms all over the carpet thinking that I'm not gonna get charged for this. Well, the carpet was a 10 year commercial grade carpet. So um, they would be charged for the remaining life of replacing that carpet. So if they were there for five years, and it was a 10 year carpet, then 50% of the cost would be the tenant's responsibility. Um, for paint, some people say five years, some people say seven years, we say three years. If you lived in the unit for one year, you move out and there's marks on the wall and somebody has to come and paint it, then you're going to be charged because, you know, um, the holes or whatever damage you think it, it would just for the cost of paint, but not the whole cost because you used one year of the three-year life, so just two-thirds of that cost. But if you've lived there for five years, and the walls are just worn and it's normal, um, then normally the landlord should not be able to charge you unless there's damage to the walls because that would be considered normal wear and tear. The most common question I have regarding normal wear and tear is cleaning. Um, people say, hey, you can't live in a house without dust, so that's normal wear and tear, and actually that's excluded. So cleaning cost is not normal wear and tear. Um, courts have allowed that the property provider receive back the unit in the clean condition as it was when it was given to the unit. So if that was broom swept, then the tenant only has to return it broom swept. If that was professionally cleaned up and down behind the walls, all of that, then that's what the expectation is and what the landlord can provide you when they get the property back. Um, you're entitled to receipts of the deductions that were made to include the service provider's name, phone number, and address if the total deductions were over $125. Um, the reason for this is, you know, the way I like to tell people is that if the security deposit's $1,000 and you're making any kind of deductions, every receipt attached to the deduction um, should complete the $1,000 that you have, you know, you know, check 500, paint 200, cleaning 300, all of that adds up to $1,000. So there shouldn't be anything missing. Um, they want you to have the service provider's name and phone number so that you can verify yourself that the cost is legitimate. Um, so if they're telling you, hey, the cleaner cost me, you know, charge me $250 and you think, oh my gosh, that's outrageous. I can't believe any cleaner would do this. I think this is fake. And you call the cleaner, um, you, you know, they can tell you, hey, these are what my rates are and you can legitimize that expense or delegitimize it if you think it's um, extraordinary. The property provider can do the work themselves, um, but if they do, they have to tell you what the reasonable hourly rate they're charging you is. So if it's for cleaning, reasonable could be about $35 to $55 an hour, um, as long as it's in line with what an outside party would be. And usually if the property provider is doing it themselves, it should be a little, it's usually less expensive, um, but it has to be reasonable. So if they're a lawyer, 
and their hourly rate is normally four hundred dollars that doesn't mean they can charge you you know twelve hundred dollars for three hours of cleaning it has to be a reasonable rate for what they're doing um and then your property can't be discarded without special notice to you and it's a 50-day notice to reclaim the property um, best practice is to remove all the property that's in there because even though you have the right to reclaim it you left a few things behind the movers for whatever reason didn't pick them up and you didn't know property providers should send you a notice saying hey you left your your duvet in a special lamp what do you want me to do with it um, and you could say oh gosh um, you know can you please mail it you still have to be responsible for the mailing and the storage costs. So don't leave anything behind because it might cost you more than what the items are worth. However, if it was inadvertent, you are entitled to another 15 days to reclaim that property. So the COVID-19 Tenant Protection Act and the special considerations during the pandemic. Um, the covered period, now this covers the rents due between March 1 and January 31, and that the non-payment of the rent was impacted due to COVID-19 related financial distress during this time period. Um, so this is this means for all the rents that were unpaid during this time period, and it was because of financial distress due, due to COVID. Um, they have two different, you know, they, they split it up in two different sections, one called the protected period, one called the transitionary period. So the protected period is for rents due between March 1 and August 31. So if you as a tenant didn't pay rents during this specific time period that were due during this specific time period, then you were entitled to receive from the property provider a notice of what your rights are regarding those rents um, by September 30th. So that time frame's come and gone, um, but you should have received that if you fall into that category. If the notice was provided, or if they, you know, um, if it was by September 30th, they could have done it concurrently, then they can give you a 15 notice to pay rent or quit. Um, but it's it's a little, it's similar to the three-day notice where they have to exclude it weekends and court holidays, but it's different than a three-day notice to pay rent or quit because it's a 15-day notice to pay rent or quit or sign a declaration that you were affected by COVID-19 and it caused you financial distress. So the 15-day notice has a special language that tells you all of these rights that if you were affected and that's why you could not pay your rent between March and August, then all you need to do is sign a declaration which is under penalty of perjury saying, hey, I was impacted, but you gotta do that within that 15-day period. And this kind of goes to your responsibility. So you get it, don't ignore it. You can say, you know, I already told him that I lost my job and you know we're all struggling and I'm doing my best and I don't know why I'm getting this 15 day notice. Like it, you know, just pause, read it, know that it's required by the state and that the requirement has the language telling you what your rights are and that you have a secondary notice telling you what your rights are. And then number three, the property provider should have provided you a blank declaration that you could just sign under penalty of perjury. So that's the distinction between having told your property provider previously before September 1 that you were impacted or having filled out a form that was required by the county or the city saying that you were impacted and were requesting a deferral because that probably doesn't have the under penalty of perjury, um, which is an, an important distinction for the property provider. Now, um, a lot of this says that you need to understand and when you read the voluminous pages of notices that you're probably gonna get that look a little bit scary. It's actually for your benefit. The state's requiring that you know and understand your rights. But the main thing you need to understand is that if you return this, you can't be evicted for that non-payment of rent at all. Not today, not when that payment comes due. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but you have to do it. If you fail to provide that 15 day notice, then what the property provider could do is they can go to court, which is, you know, tenuous as to how they're going to prevail, but they do have the right legally under the law to go to court and um, file an unlawful detainer against you to terminate the tenancy. So the transitionary period is for rents that were due September 1 through January 31. Now, everything is pretty much the same as the protected period, except for one thing. It's requiring that you also pay 25% of the rents due in September, October, November, December, and January. So for that five months period, 
you have to pay at least 25% of the rents that are due. It doesn't mean that you have to pay it each month that it is due. It means that you have to pay it by January 31, 2021. So your responsibility, again, is don't ignore. If you were impacted and have a financial distress and it was due to COVID, sign the blank declaration that's included in your notice. That's number one. And number two, understand again that you're not going to be evicted if you're impacted, sign the sign, but you also have to pay one and a quarter months of rent by January 31. So that's the period of five months. So five months that you have to pay 25%. No, by January 31, you have to at least pay one and a quarter months of rent to the property provider in order for you to be protected from eviction. So what happens to the rent owed during the protected period? Um, and this is, you know, and it could change because there, there, they might be enacting new laws January 31, but as we know it today, all the rent that's due during the protected period, less that one and a quarter months of rent, um, you are responsible still for paying it back. And the property provider cannot evict you if you don't pay it back by March 1, 2021. But what they can do is take you to small claims court and get a judgment. And that's, it, it could be problematic for you as a tenant because that would affect your credit rating. Um, so that's what the state law provides. Now, here in our community, a lot of the city ordinances have passed, and specifically City of Santa Barbara says that they are giving you an additional year to make equal installment payments of the past rent due meaning that the property provider has to wait until you've defaulted on the payment obligation. The other thing that the City of Santa Barbara um, ordinance provides is that you guys can agree to any period that's shorter or, you know, and frankly, you, if you and your property provider have a good communication and you guys are understanding, you guys can agree to a longer term. Um, so just know that, but if you have questions or want somebody helping you get that put together, then um, you can go to the Rental Housing Mediation Board for free and they can help you put an agreement together that you guys are all happy with. So that is the end of my presentation. I'm not sure if I have any time to take questions, but if there are, I'm going to just um, stop sharing my monitor so I can kind of have a better idea. Um, Thank you, Michelle. Yes, there is a question and it is for those purposes you listed that allow landlord to enter the premises with the exception of emergencies, is there any requirement to communicate with a tenant to set up a time or can they just knock on your door with no warning? Except for emergencies, um, there is no requirement that the landlord set up with the tenant um, that, um, you know, that do it. It's good practice though. Nobody wants to post a notice or 24 hour notice and wonder what they're gonna come, come into. But the landlord has the right to only post a 24 hour notice and be allowed entry within that 20, after that 24 hour period expires. So there's no requirement to agree or not agree, but you can agree and that's better practice to do for all parties. Great, if, and uh, are there any other questions for Michelle? I don't see any questions that have come up, um, but if you're just joining us now and you miss part of the presentation or you want to go back and, and look at the presentation, uh, Michelle covered quite a bit. Uh, there were a lot of laws enacted at the beginning of this year. And on top of that, all of the COVID protections, you did a fantastic job, Michelle. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. Um, There's one more question that maybe I can answer. Um, oh, okay. Is the rent increase, is it per year? And if you're not exempt, it is per year, that amount. Um, but they could do it in up to two times. So they can do 3%, you know, because right now our CPI is 1%. So if it's a 6% per year for this year, they can do 3% right now and 3% four months later, as long as it doesn't exceed the CPI. So it is per year. Thank Great, you. thank you. I know there's a lot to be covered, a lot to, to know, and thank you for this presentation. Again, we, this is being recorded and it will be available for you to view on Santa Barbara, on, I'm sorry, housingsantabarbara.org. And there will be links also from the Housing Authority's website. Thank you again, Michelle. Thank you.